Hey guys, welcome to the latest episode of this unbelievable life. Today I have with me Corey Burdett from the USS LSD Memorial. Corey has always loved museums and history since he was young. Little did he know that his love and interest in museums and documentaries would lead him to receive his Bachelor's of Arts in History and Social Studies from Western Kentucky University in 2019. In his over five-year career so far, Corey has worked at the Historic Rail Park and Train Museum in Bowling Green, Kentucky, the Wright Home Museum in Evansville, Indiana, and now currently at the USS LST Ship Memorial Incorporated, also in Evansville, Indiana, as the Museum Operation Coordinator. Corey, take it away. Thank you very much for having me, Miss Nikki. And uh, yeah, so I guess we're just going to get started with what what we what we do at the LST. So. The uh, USS LST Ship Memorial, Inc., uh, we're located in Evansville, Indiana. We're right on Riverside Drive, right by the Bally's Casino. Can't miss it. She's about 328 feet long, 50 feet wide. But uh, what we do here is we are a museum, and we tell the story of the LSTs. So LSTs are, LST stands for Landing Ship Tank, and they were made in World War II, and they are the largest transport ships that were made in World War II. And they would go on to be used... Besides World War II in Korea and even Vietnam, and I'm going to talk a little bit later more about that as we go on through this video today. And originally, the idea for LSTs actually came from none other than Winston Churchill. You might know that name from World War II. He served as the Prime Minister of Great Britain. But in World War I, he was known as what was called the First Lord of the Admiralty. He was in charge of a lot of different landing operations. And after the war, he decided that it would be a good idea to basically take the ship knowledge that they had at the time and incorporated in something new to where they could get all their equipment, all their troops, everything on shore directly instead of relying on smaller boats and things like that that could get destroyed by enemy aircraft, enemy, enemy bombs, things like that too. So we were talking back and forth with the United States and Great Britain at the time, and eventually a guy by the name of John C. Niedermayer of the U.S. Navy Bureau of Ships he was appointed to design what we know today as the LST. So again, LST stands for landing ship tank and a standard LST is 320 feet long, 50 feet wide, and she can weigh about 1400 tons by herself. Now with all of her equipment and everything that she have on board, she could weigh up to 1700 tons, give or take, the, what she had on board. So a standard LST would hold around 30 trucks. They could hold up to 20 tanks. Uh, we would hold 20 Sherman tanks, each roughly weighing about 40 tons each. And we could also hold around 200 troops at the same time. And we also had a crew of 110, including eight to 10 officers. And again, over 200 troops that we'd have. So over 300 personnel on board at the same time. So LSTs would eventually be used in a variety of different operations. One of the biggest ones, which would be the Operation Operation Overlord, which you might know better today is D-Day, June 6, 1944. But the LST-325 has a really unique story by herself. She was actually not built here in Evansville. We actually built LSTs here in Evansville. It was the Evansville Shipyard, but the official name was the Missouri Valley Bridge and Iron Company, but we just like to call it the Evansville Shipyard. It's a little bit easier to say. But we built them. We built actually the most LSTs in all the United States. We built 167 LSTs in just under three years here. The Evansville Shipyard employed over 22,000 people, roughly half of that workforce being women by themselves. So that's really kind of neat. And also there was a, a good number of African-Americans that also helped out as well. Now we did more than just LSTs in Evansville during World War II. We also built P-47 Thunderbolt fighter planes, over 6,000 of those. And we also contributed to bullets. There was over a trillion bullets that were made in World War II. And here in Evansville, we made around 95% of the 45 caliber shells for the World War II effort right here in Evansville. So going back to LSTs. So the LST-325 actually wasn't built here in Evansville. She was originally built in 1942 at the Philadelphia Shipyard in Pennsylvania. She be commissioned in 1943 into the Navy, and she immediately saw action with the invasions of Sicily and Salerno, Italy. And for you history um, military buffs out there, uh, that would be Operations Husky and Avalanche. And then eventually she would serve in Operation Overlord, which again, you might know better today as D-Day, executed on June 6, 1944. Until the end of World War II, she go back and forth from Normandy to England a total of 44 times until the end of the war, transporting fresh troops and supplies over to France, 
and bring back wounded soldiers and German POWs or prisoners of war back over to England. She'd be decommissioned in 1946 from the Navy, and but that would only be temporary because in the 1950s, she'd go back into military service and part of what's called Operation Sunak. Or another name for it is the Dewline Radar Missions Project. So Dewline stands for Distance Early Warning, and there was a, a series of radar detection systems that was put up in the Arctic Circle right above Canada. And it was basically a defense circle in case of possible nuclear attacks during the Cold War. And the LST was sent up to Greenland to help make supply runs for that. And then she would be part of the Greek Navy from 1964 and 1999. So how that happens. So the Greek Hellenic Navy was basically depleted after World War II. They didn't have enough ships to train their own Navy. So they went to a lot of different countries, including the United States. And they basically just asked them, hey, do you guys have any ships you guys aren't using that we can use to train our guys so we can get them going and doing operations while we build up our Navy back? So they came to the United States and they came and inspected a variety of ships that were in different different areas and basically they were all being mothballed which is another term for just long-term storage and so they came and saw the 325 thought she was in really good condition and we basically signed her over from 1964 to 1999. after that she was purchased by the lst memorial fund in the year 2000 and she came back to the united states in the year 2001 arrived here in evansville in 2005 and she's been here ever since uh the current location that we're at right now is a little different than the one she used to be at she used to be a little bit further down the river at a place called Marina Point. And then a few years ago, around the end of 2019 and into 2020, the casino Aztar Paddle Boats, which I don't know if you guys remember that or not, but they used to be a big thing here in Evansville. But it got purchased by a company in New Orleans and it went down south. And whenever they left, we took their spot and we've been here ever since. And as they say, the rest is history. But if you come here and check us out, we have a little visitor center and museum area that tells you a little bit about the history of LSTs, a little bit about the story of the 325 and a variety of other different things that we have in our archive collection, which me as a museum operations coordinator, that's what I do. I So I take care of archives, I take care of the exhibits, I take care of research, I do educational presentations, which I'm gonna consider this an educational presentation. And, uh, <laughs> We also, let's see, also I'm part of IT. I do the website. I do a variety of different things so here. We all wear a lot of hats here at the LST. Uh, we do a variety of different things because there's always something to get done on ship. But anyway, so going back to LSTs. So LSTs would be used in Korea and they would also be used in Vietnam. And there's even some modern day iterations of LSTs that are used a variety of different places. We There's actually some older World War II era LSTs that are currently being used overseas, usually in the, in Southeast Asia, you'll see the, they basically bought our old stuff and they use it today for a variety of different things. And there's even talks with the, both the United States and the Marines about bringing back their amphibious units. And they're currently working on different designs and things like that, also incorporating the World War II designs into modern day. So I think it's really kind of neat seeing how history is kind of just pulled into the present and hopefully into eventually the future. Yeah, so armaments on ship. So we do have guns on ship. I, I don't know if you can see it in the picture that I have right over here. You can kind of see up there. But we do have guns on ship. And we do, let's see, we have 12 20 millimeter Orlick and anti aircraft cannons. And all the guns that we have on ship, by the way, are all anti aircraft guns. We never shot down other boats or ships because we had other boats and ships do that for us. LSTs would travel in convoys and they would never be by themselves usually surrounded by patrol boats, cruisers, things like that, or even battleships or destroyers in some cases, depending on the situation. So we had 12 like short range guns, the Orlikans, and then we also had one, two, three, four, four single barrel 40 millimeter Beaufort cannons and two double barrel or twin barrel 40 millimeter Beaufort cannons. And then we also had a slew of 50 cal or 30 to 50 cal machine guns, depending on the armaments and depending on who was on ship and things like that. And the LST can also hold 188,000 gallons of fuel, which sounds really impressive. But at the same time, she would go through that oil rather quick. But something that's kind of neat about LSTs is that they could be used for basically a mobile gas station, if you need, if you want to think about it like that. So if other ships were coming across the ocean or coming across the English Channel and they needed a fuel up, there was a way that you can run a fuel line over to that ship and they can get taken care of. And then a variety of other different things. So LSTs would be known as the workhorses of the Navy due to a variety of different things they could carry on ship. So for instance, we would have the 
I told you about, we held 20 Sherman tanks, weighing roughly about 40 tons each. We also held trucks. We also could hold a train on board. There are some pictures that I've been able to find of some LSTs holding trains. We could even transport planes. So you guys might have heard of aircraft carriers. Those are really, really popular. Everyone knows about those. But aircraft carriers were still relatively new in World War II. So LSTs, LSTs could function as an aircraft carrier if you ever needed them to up on the up on the main deck right here. Or something else they could do is they could have a big metal arm called a Brody device that would basically launch these little planes called Elbert planes that would fly out from the LST and they would come back on these little big metal hooks. And let's see, what else can I tell you? The Oh, so we would transport these. Uh, you can see my finger right over here. This little boat right here is called a Higgins boat. So Higgins boats, probably one of my favorite things coming out of World War II. So Higgins boats are little boats. The official name is the LCVP or Landing Craft Vehicle Personnel. But I like to call them Higgins boats because they're named after Andrew Jackson Higgins, the guy who designed them. He was a fishing boat maker in New Orleans, Louisiana. And he and his crew down there made a majority of them. But we made over 20,000 of these boats in World War II. They're made of wood or fiberglass with a steel door on the front. They can hold 35 to 40 combat ready troops, up to 8,000 pounds of cargo, or even small vehicles like Jeeps. So, for instance, in World War II, you'd have the famous Willie's Jeep. A lot of people know those. But, yeah, one of those Jeeps could fit in there. And you can even use these as lifeboats if you really needed to. But how they came down was with, if you can see it right above my finger, that little arm sticking out there. So those are called davits. So the davits run down on the track down below to the main deck. And then there's a cable that takes over that lowers the boat all the way down to the water. Then the guys use a little cargo net that they throw over the side of the main deck, go climb down to the boats. And then it has its own onboard motor and goes right off wherever it needs to. Now you might recognize that little boat if you ever seen war movies like Saving Private Ryan, for instance. Really good movie. And during that Normandy invasion scene at the beginning of the movie, that's what they're using to get up onto the beach. Now, one of the one of our boats, we actually have four of them. But one of our boats was actually used in a film. It wasn't Saving Private Ryan. A lot of people, a lot of people think it was used in Saving Private Ryan, but it was actually used in a movie called Flags of Our Fathers, which is a movie by Clint Eastwood. And it's about the guys that the famous picture of the guys that raised the flag at Iwo Jima. And it's about their stories and everything like that. But they had some landing scenes for the movie and they they used one of our one of our boats for that. And let's see, what else can I tell you? Oh, so let's see, let's go up here to the bridge. So if you can see my finger right over here. So this is the bridge. So the bridge is a fancy name for a communications tower in World War II. So that's where you have your radio operators. Radio operators are taking care of mes messages coming back and forth from the ship. Now they're usually communicating with Morse code. So the famous, like the beep, 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 that thing. And they are receiving messages in a headset that they're wearing. And they are also responding with a little telegraph button that they'd have at their desk. But something else they're doing at the same time, they're interpreting the messages that they're hearing on a typewriter in front of them. So they have to type and they also have to respond usually at the same time. And these guys had to know how to do up to 80 words a minute to keep their job. And also with tele or with uh, typewriters, there's no such thing as auto or spell correct. You know, today we get a little, little pampered with technology. And if we mess something up on a keyboard or something, it usually fixes it. Didn't have that in World War II. And yeah, and then let's see, LST, uh, we're going to go down into the, near the engine rooms. So that's down over this way is where the engine rooms are. So in standard LST is powered by two V12 General Motors like to mow diesel engines producing 900 horsepower piece. So 1800 horsepower. And there are two propellers on the back. You can't see it because they're in the water, but they're in the back over here. And this thing is surprisingly very slow. So LSTs only had a top speed of about 10 knots or roughly about 15 miles per hour. Just to put in perspective, they're adult humans that can run about 20 miles per hour. So the crew often joked that she was the last ship there and a large slow targets. And another name they nicknamed for her is a large steel tub because LSTs are flat bottom ships. I don't know if you can really see it with this picture, but they are flat bottom ships. They're made that way so they can get up around to the shore. Then they can drop off all their equipment and then make them way, make their way back if they needed to. Now, because they're flat bottom, most of the time boats have keels that are kind of more V-pointed. 
And so they don't really toss around so much. But since it's a flat bottom ship, she's tossing back and forth in the ocean. And they call it listing. And she could list anywhere from 45 up to 60 degrees in some cases. And that's both ways. So they call her a large steel tub for that reason. And then also, that's why we have, like, if you see all these trucks and everything up here, they're all tied down with, and you can't see the cables, I apologize, but there are these really long metal cables that would attach onto the main deck in these little raised humps, basically, called wilted pads, it's also called clovers, and they would just be used to tie down everything that you needed to, so that way it doesn't go flying off in the ocean when the LST is tilting like so back and forth. But yeah, and then let's see. So the so guns on ship. I'm gonna go back to the guns real fast. So all the guns that we have on ship are anti-aircraft guns, and they are all they are all explosive head shell guns. So I don't know if you know what that means or not, but basically what happens is the barrels for the guns are all rifle barrels. So if person watching doesn't know what that means. That means they have grooves or lines on the inside to cause the projectile to spin as it's coming out, usually improving the accuracy. But as it's spinning, there's a little ticker inside. So a standard bullet will have a head. It would be about right here. And then everything else would be filled with gunpowder. And there's a little ticker right in the middle that will go off and it'll ignite all the gunpowder stored here. And it'll rip apart the head up here into millions of pieces called shrapnel. And they're hoping that by the time the plane gets to where that shrapnel is up in the air, it'll start ripping through the plane, eventually cause it to go down after a while. And we had 12 of those um, 20 millimeters. So there would be six along this side. You can actually see one, I think, sticking up right over there. But there would be six going down that side, six going down the other side of the ship. And then the bofers are more towards the end. So they're up there in those little turrets that you can see. And there's one, well, there we go. There we go, right over there and right over there. And again, so the Bofors are the long range guns and the Orlicans are the short range guns. And the short range guns are actually shooting a lot more bullets than the long range ones. They can shoot up to 400, over 400 bullets a minute. And the larger long range guns can shoot around 120 bullets a minute. Oh, so uh, the LST, uh, LST-325. So something that's really, really, really important about the LST-325 and kind of our mission, uh, a part of our mission here at the at the LST Ship Memorial Inc. is that she is still functional. We can still, we still use her. And she can go out on, we call it cruise here in the crew, but she goes out on trips usually in the fall. So this year we're going to be leaving a little bit earlier than normal. We're going to be heading out more in August, but it's anywhere between August to September, sometimes even early October is when we'll be out. But we go to a variety of different port cities. We've been to up north. We've been up to Pens or Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We've been all the way down to New Orleans, Louisiana. We've been to Mobile, Alabama. We've been to uh, all along the Mississippi and the Ohio River. This past year, we went to Cincinnati, Ohio. We went to Ashland, Kentucky, and Charleston, West Virginia. This year, we're going to we're going up north in the Mississippi. So we're going to be heading to La Crosse, Wisconsin. Hannibal, Missouri, and Dubuque, Iowa. And if you want to find out more information about that, we are sending out information on our Facebook page and also our websites. And we're constantly updating information on both ends. So just be sure to keep checking back every or whenever you can to stay up to date as much as possible. LSTs provide a very important role in World War II and even beyond, like just in military in general. Because the just the fact that you have like a ship that can hold so much and then it can just bring it right up onto the shore. That was a real game changer. And it personally, whenever I started working here, even before I started working here, I knew you had to get all that equipment and everything onto the beaches, especially during like Normandy and, and other invasions and things like that. But I didn't know really about the LSTs and still, until I started working here. And it's kind of sad that I'm not really talked about more in like in schools or even just in general and they really did play a very big big vital role in world war ii and there was a lot of people that served on them and a lot of people that would come through them and they just really played a big part in world war ii and here in evansville uh, we're just that's what we do we just we tell our story we tell people stories that are related to the lst like right now uh, probably one of my biggest my one of my favorite memories right now of the LST has actually just happened not too recently, but I got to talk to one of the last living 325 crew members from World War II. Uh, he was celebrating his 100-year 
birthday. His name was Richard Everett Martin. And he was a, um, he was a machinist uh, down in the engine room. And he, uh, it was just really neat just talking to him and just hearing, hearing his stories. And even for a hundred year, hundred year old man, he was still like, still like he could remember it. He could tell you things. And it was really, really impressive. I didn't get to see him in person. It was over video call, but it was still really cool. And I was sad to say he, he died a week later, but it was still really like that. It just brought it home. It just made it real. Because, you know, you can talk about facts, figures, things like that, but it's the, the people make it real. And it's the those kind of stories that really make it relatable. Another interesting tidbit that a lot of people have asked me numerous times with being a military ship, is the ship haunted? Yes. So the LST is haunted. Uh, so the, the main ghost that we have on ship, we refer to as, as Jonathan. And Jonathan was a sailor that was part of the part of the Greek Navy whenever the LST was in the Greek Navy. And we're not exactly sure if he was Greek or if he was American because there were some Americans that were helping out during that time, too. But we, we don't really know for sure. But he um, so his story goes that he was serving on ship. He enjoyed everything about it, but he also enjoyed drinking a lot. And. Sad to say that would eventually lead to his downfall because he went over to the galley, the place where you get your food right over here. And he went around 3 a.m. trying to wrestle himself something up to eat one or one evening. And he was still a little tops and turvy from night before when he went out drink with his boys that he was going downstairs to eat in what's called the mess deck. So that's where the it's basically where you would eat. And he was going downstairs and he stumbled downstairs, busted his head open and he was found the next day dead. Because at that time, around 3 a.m., there's hardly anyone else that's awake. You usually have people that would be up here in the bridge for watch. But other than that, everyone else is asleep. And they're sleeping all along down over this way. So they wouldn't have heard anything over here. So he was found next day dead. So the crew would often tell you that they've heard, they've heard footsteps around the galley area. They've seen doors opening and closing by themselves. And weird voices come from nowhere. We even captured one of our video cameras a while back. And I actually had a personal encounter well, not really with Jonathan, but I'm definitely, I'm pretty sure it's with, I'm pretty sure it was Jonathan. So on tour, by the way, we do guided tours of the LST. Uh, if you ever want to come down here, check it out. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a little bit. But one day on a guided tour, we go over here to where the Higgins boat is that I was telling you about earlier. And we were going over here and up above, you can not really see in this picture, but there is a little, there's a little speaker intercom looking thing and that's the ship's air horn the modern day air horn and the we were given my tour and i was about to talk about the higgins boat when that air horn went off above me and my tour group for about three to five minutes without stopping well that horn's pretty stinking loud when you're right underneath it and afterwards i sent out just a general radio call to some guys that we had on ship and i said hey should the ship's air horn be going off for any reason and they were just confused as I was, and they went all the way up to the top of the comm tower, which you can't see it because the comm tower was a feature that was added after World War II, but it's where we control the ship today. And they went up to the comm tower to turn off the air horn because that's where the controls are located. Come to find out, the comm tower door was locked from the outside when they went to investigate, and the only person with the key that could get inside, so again, this is happening all up here, they were all the way down over here about two to three decks below while that was going on. So I think it's Jonathan. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> and let's see. Uh, probably one of my favorite stories that I've heard on about the LST is, so I talked to you about cruises uh, when we go out on, when we go out to different port cities and things like that. This is one of my first stories that I heard whenever I started working here. But whenever we go on cruise, we usually will open up the front. So you see these doors and ramp. Or over here, that's what their vehicles would be used to get on and off the ship back in World War II. But today, we just open it up, and there's like a little portable gangway that we can bring out so people can walk onto the ship, and then they can go around on ship, and then there's like a little gift shop, and it's a fun time. And we attract people from all walks of life, veterans, non-veterans, you name it. And one day, there was a lady in a wheelchair that came in onto the ship, and she requested to go up to the main deck ASAP. And to get some guys to help, help her do it. Well, she wasn't rich, wasn't famous, wasn't like a Hollywood movie star or anything like that. Just a regular person in a wheelchair. 
and they brought her up to the main deck. She willed herself to a certain area of the main deck, and she stopped, and she pointed down with her finger where it intersects on the main deck like a T, and she pointed right where it intersects, and she said, I welded that spot. Then it made, made sense why she had to get up there. But it's just really, really cool for the fact that she remembered the ship, but she also remembered exactly where she worked. I just think that's really that's fantastic. Like, just gives me chills every time. And it's just, again, it's just making that real. Because nowadays, like, history, there, I don't know if it's changed in recent years, but I know whenever I was in school, a lot of the kids didn't like taking history class. I was one of the rare ones. I loved history class. But the... <laughs> but because like for for them history is in the past and it's like okay these people have been dead for 200 300 400 years and what what does that have to do with me like why why is that why does that make sense or why do i have to why do i why should i learn this what is, what is it doing for me well history is really important because it shows you a lot of things in the past like both good things and bad things and you can learn from it so that way it doesn't get repeated in the future. But also something else about history that I think is really cool is just diving into history and just be seeing those stories. Like, for instance, about the lady building, building the LST. Like, it, it just makes it more real. It makes it more like this person had a family. This person had, you know, she was just, she was doing a job like that she probably worked really, really hard to get to. Because there's constant stories that I've heard about people like giving up everything for what they needed to just to contribute to the United States during World War II. Like, for instance, like Victory Gardens and the um, and rationing and people just even going to fight. Like, and like, for instance, like women are really, really inspiring in World War II because this is one of the first times in military history that you had women going in and doing what was considered a man's work at the time. But on top of that, still taking care of the kids. So you got to like, you know, and doing all this stuff at home on top of holding a full-time job. And it's just, it's really, really inspiring. Just seeing what, just seeing how, even though we were kind of a little divided in World War II as a country, we were still probably as unified in World War II as we probably have ever been. And it just, it, it's very, very inspiring. And because the United States didn't want to get involved in World War II originally, because we were still reeling from World War I, and we were also going through going through the Great Depression and everything like that. And then this definitely this World War II definitely in brought or it definitely gave that push that the United States needed to to really emerge as a as a global superpower and eventually in turn becoming what we know it as today. And all right. And um, I guess what the last thing I'm going to leave leave you guys with, uh, I got two things. Uh, first thing is, or three things. First thing, we are a museum. Uh, feel free to come on out to LST, the LST 325. Uh, we're open for our summer hours. We're open every day except Monday. We're open 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. And we offer guided tours on the hour. Our tours are about an hour long. And if you want to find out more information about that, feel free to give us a call. Or you can also look us up on the online. Uh, we have a US or excuse me, www.lstmemorial.org. Or you can also find us on Facebook. And we are more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Because believe me, there's a lot of them, especially with parking and everything around here. It gets nuts down here in downtown Evansville. But also a uh, second thing is for anyone who's watching, especially for younger people who are watching and you want to, you want to kind of do what I do or someone like me, go for it. Like literally this has been like the, this is probably the most rewarding thing I've ever done with my life, except for, well, except for having my son. That's, that, that's, that's, that's the most rewarding thing. But the, um, but just, if you have a dream, go for it. Like people will talk to you all the time and tell you like, you know, like you need to do this. You need to do that. What about you? Like you, like you, you have an idea, go for it. That That's like, just, just go for it. You, Cause you never know what can happen. Like I didn't, if you told middle school Corey that he would be working in a museum on a World War II ship, he would probably laugh right in your face. But <laughs> it's just, it's, it's just been fascinating. And then the last thing I'm going to leave you with is probably one of my favorite quotes about LSTs that I read about back in World War, or in one of my books that I did for prior research before coming to LST. 
In World War II, if the military personnel were akin to a spear's head or the sharp part of a spear, the LSTs are akin to the spear's shaft or the wooden handle parts. And the American people that built them were the arm that threw the spear. We couldn't have won the war without them. All right, and thank you very much for having me here. I am, I'm just so thrilled. Uh, thank you again for having me. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to me personally. Uh, my email is archives, A-R-C-H-I-V-E-S, at lstmemorial.org. And I'm more than happy to talk to you, answer questions. I also do presentations. Um, so I can do a little bit more of a broader presentation than what I'm doing here. And I can also bring stuff from ship so I can go to schools, I can go to churches, I can go to youth groups, what, whatever you need me to do. And just, you know, just send me an email, give me a call. I'm more than happy to reach out to you because we just need to get her story told. And people just need to, honestly, it's a story people need to hear. But thank you again very much. Appreciate it. Corey, I am so glad that you have such a passion for history. Thank you so much for sharing so much. I I had First off, I had no idea about the flat bottom and that it could go all the way on the shore. I think I find that absolutely amazing. But but what a wild history ours, our LST has, and just LST in general. So thank you again so much for sharing. And thank you to everybody who took the time to listen today. And again, if you guys have any questions, reach out directly to Corey or hop on their website or their social media to, to learn more because it's all about preserving our history so that we can learn from the mistakes of our past. And so again, Corey, thank you so much for sharing your unbelievable life and the unbelievable lives of those who created and made, you know, these, these ships and then those who served on them. What an honor, you know, uh, all the way around. So again, thank you everyone for listening. Take care and have a blessed and wonderful day. Thank you.